So we're going to talk about what are the problems of sound in a room that we're solving, right? So that we can work and get work done and feel confident about our work and your students, right? Things like learning how to mix is really hard. There's a lot going on there, right? You have to not only learn the techniques and what's the attack and the release do on the compressor, but you also have to learn what all that sounds like, right? You know, because you can have the abstractions of the techniques, but until you really become conversant with the sounds that are being produced, that's the whole point. And if you're working and mixing in an untreated room, that room is gonna get in the way of your work because you can't hear what you're doing very well. I use the analogy, it's like a painter trying to do a painting, but they've got like psychedelic sunglasses on, right? <laughs> and you, you're like, you can't quite see the colors. That's a similar analogy when we're working in an untreated room because of how the room is affecting what you're hearing. Do you guys know what a frequency response graph is? You guys conversant with that frequency on the x-axis level on the y-axis, right? I get a lot of those. People send me those. Here's what my room is. And I'm like, well, okay, that's cool. That's useful, right? That gives us a little bit of information about your room because you can generate those pretty easily. There's a lot of software packages you can use to get a response reading. The analogy that uh, I like to use is that's like hiking with a compass, right? It gives you some useful information. It can get you where you need to go. We're going to look at spectrograms. You guys familiar with those before? Have you seen them? These give you a lot more information because a lot of what happens in a room doesn't show up in the frequency response graph. And there's other problems that we have to solve and we have to understand what the problem is before we can solve it. So here we go, here's a spectrogram. And this is literally a client sent me this a while ago. Um, and it was a classic case of a home studio. If I remember right, it was about a 10 by 14 room, like a bedroom, right? So let's, let's look at this, okay? So the spectrogram is a little different from, yeah, the frequency response graph. We still have frequency on the x-axis left to right, but level instead of on the y-axis, level is depicted in color, okay? I think of this, and this, John gave me this one. I think of this as the view from 30,000 feet, right, of what your room is doing. So the reds down there on the low end, those are the loudest points. So the level's in color. Whereas the deep blues, that's just barely above the noise floor. The y-axis now, instead of level, is decay time, okay? How long does it take that frequency to decay in the room? And that's a very, very, very big part of the challenges we have to overcome. Let's look at this here for a second, okay? We can see, you know, the bass response, we can see the mid-range, we can see the treble. What do you guys notice? about this, like, like, like translate that if you can, like what do you think this room is gonna sound like? Very mid-rangey, how come? Look at these decay times. This is 1.5K 1, 1 down to 300 hertz. That's exactly the mid-range, right? This line going across here is about 650 milliseconds. Think of like a reverb decay time. That's, you know, noticeable for sure, you know? So yeah, for sure, the mid-range is gonna linger in the room longer. The, uh, that's gonna be the reverb. And like if you put a reverb plug in on someone or on, on a track or something and you adjust the decay time, it's the same decay time for all the frequencies. I mean, there's probably specialty plugins now that where that's not the case, but in general, that's the case. So one of the challenges is the decay times are different at different frequencies. What causes all this? Why, why is this happening in the room? And the short answer, it's reflections. Reflected sound energy is creating all this stuff. The way that sound behaves in the room, sound requires time sound does not exist without time it's vibration if it's there's no time it's not moving right so the time is built into it and then also you get reflected sound waves that are moving around the room interfering with other sound waves okay and it's just like phase relationships right when you're using two microphones on the same source and some frequencies they cancel out like here for instance there's not much energy there here right but in other frequencies it gets really loud because the phase relationships are such that they build up and you get those loud peaks. But all of it has the same cause. It's reflected sound waves interfering with each other. Looking more at this, it's very mid-rangey. Anybody notice anything else about the graph? I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what I see. And there's a concept here that I'm introducing. It's called the Schroeder frequency. And every room has one. Above the Schroeder frequency, sound behaves a little differently than below the frequency. And we can see that in the graph. Above that point, Look how closely spaced all those spikes are in time. It's a very more even wash. Below there, it's more spread out. There's more resonances. That's what the bass is doing, okay? So instead of a reverb, like you would get in the mids and the highs, you get specific tuned resonances that are related to the room's dimensions and several other things. 
where the speakers are in the room will affect that. It requires a couple of different approaches to fix it. And again, all these problems we're talking about have the same effect, or the same cause, sorry, and that is reflected sound. So what we can do is put treatments in the room, right, that are going to absorb or diffuse those reflections and keep them from doing this. Sound also has size, right, especially the bass. Those are really long wavelengths, right, as far as how they move through the room. And like this one here, this is the biggest one, both of these really. So that's 90 hertz, that's about 140 hertz. And even below there, the big one all the way on the left side, that's what, 40, 48 hertz. So I looked this up so I know. That's sort of right between F sharp and G. So what happens if you're trying to mix a song in the key of G, where the kick drum is tuned to the, the G, right? You're trying to mix that, but all you hear is whoa, 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 you know? And then, again, related to the time thing, do you guys see this little black line squiggly graph there? That is the peak energy curve. In other words, when is the sound at that frequency loudest after it's excited? Here at 90, that's about 100 milliseconds. That means when that kick drum hits, 100 milliseconds later, it's loudest. You hear that resonance. So it's like, you know what I mean? So when we treat the room, look what happened. It looks a lot different, right? Okay, so this is a very simple baseline treatment strategy with GIK. The big question I ask people is, how much space can we use in the room to fix it? You guys go into Studio C, the control room, and you know the treatments are what, four feet thick, three feet thick? High-end rooms use a lot of space to fix this stuff. And we don't always have that luxury, you know, especially in home studios. If you got a 10 by 14 room and you're using four feet in all four walls, you don't have any space left, right? So. We have to maximize what we're gonna do. So this result here comes from our, our it was the very first GIK product, the 244. Still absolutely one of my favorites. It's very versatile, very cost effective, and you can get a lot of them on a low budget. One of the uh, most important parts of the results we're gonna get with acoustics is about coverage area. In other words, how many square feet of treatment are we adding to the room relative to the room's size? And then the thickness of the panel is gonna determine how it does at base frequencies. Mm -hmm. Thicker, all else being equal, is probably better. Um, so that's a basic setup. You can see a diagram of the guy's room there, right? So you've got you know several panels up in the front of the room where the mix desk is, and then panels on the rear wall. Not a ton of space we're using in the room. But look how different it is. Go back and forth a couple times, Mike. Mid-range and treble, go ahead back, much more consistent, right? Way more consistent. And then look at the bass resonances, the upper bass stuff especially. Look how improved that is. Those resonances, the decay times are much shorter. Still not perfect, we have a long way to go. But even 45 hertz, look at that one. Even that got a little bit better. And that's just with, you know, four inch thick absorbers. So if we can use bigger devices like the next one up from the, G the 244 is the Monster Bass Trap. It's the exact same thing, but it's a six inch absorber inside instead of a four. So it's gonna do better at the base. We'd get even better results if we were using those. And then we can use bigger products from there. So it always comes down to how much space we can use.